Hi guys, I'm back. This was uh, last week we talked about oxygen delivery. This is kind of a continuation of uh, that talking about positive pressure ventilation. This is mostly about mechanical ventilation. Uh, there's one a single slide on BiPAP, but I'll kind of go over the concept. Um, BiPAP could be a separate lecture on its own. Uh, so there's a lot of tangential movement in this lecture, but we'll get back to the, the point wherever we go off on tangent. Anyone know what's going on there? In that picture? What's not right? There's two vents. Good, good, good. You guys are doing great. Okay. So this is a, a double lumen ET tube. So you've actually, if someone starts bleeding out of one lung, you put a double lumen ET tube in and you put each lumen to a separate vent and use lower tidal volumes in each ventilator. You don't see it very often. I thought that was something we could start off with. Okay. So um, things we're going to talk about today. Uh, why is someone uh, intubated uh, and, and the reasons why they get intubated and make sure they, we fix those before we talk about extubation. Uh, talk about the different modes of mechanical ventilation. Uh, that's where it kind of gets confusing and then also learn how to set the initial ventilator settings, which would be something you'd be tasked with in the MICU. Uh, know what injury you can cause with the ventilator. Uh, lots of different ones and we'll talk about those. Uh, figuring out alarms, what to do when your vent starts alarming. Um, and then knowing um, how to know your patient's ready for extubation. So uh, starting off with reasons a patient gets intubated, um, perioperative uh, is something that I don't deal with as much. It's more anesthesia. Um, medical ICU deals with uh, the other four in addition to that. We'll grade that perioperative out. Um, so someone's uh, oxygen's low, use conventional oxygen delivery equipment, couldn't get their SATs up, high flow, BiPAP, nasal cannula, oximizer, whatever it is. Uh, and you want to put them on the ventilator to oxygenate them. That's one reason. Uh, CO2 is the other reason for ventilation. Uh, and this can be um, in different instances. So you can use it to blow off CO2 to lower ICP. You can use it in respiratory acidosis where someone has a COPD exacerbation or bad pneumonia with underlying lung disease and you want to correct the acidosis by blowing off CO2. Uh, and then you have people at home who are on ventilators think people who have ALS or GBS and they have a tracheostomy and they use a trilogy ventilator um, and so to assist with neuromuscular disease because they also uh, hypoventilate. Um, also, mental status is one of the most common. What's the most common diagnosis in the ICU? Found down. All of those guys get a tube. So error protection is one of the biggest things. And the last one's also very common in the ICU. So people who are septic, their metabolic demands go up. They get hypoxic because you have cellular hypoxia. And then their, their requirements from mechanical ventilation, they're actually doing the breathing. They go up and they get intubated. So not necessarily that they have sepsis from pneumonia. They could have sepsis from UTI. And they end up getting intubated because you want to support um, their thing. So those are the three main things that we do for a patient on a ventilator. Oxygenate, ventilate, and protect their airway. Airway protection is done by this. This cuff is all about airway protection. So when you, and we'll talk about this in a little detail as well, this is where you inflate a cuff in the trachea and you kind of isolate the trachea away from the hypopharynx and from reflux coming from the esophagus. So nothing can enter the trachea if this cuff stays inflated uh, into the trachea. So you're preventing aspiration, you're preventing other things uh, that a patient may not be able to protect their airway for. So talking about oxygenation, there are two main parameters we set on a ventilator uh, to oxygenate a patient, FiO2, which is if you go up on it, you're increasing the amount of oxygen you're giving a patient, and then PEEP. So we'll talk about the concept of PEEP, but what it really is, is we keep the airway patent. So when you breathe out the lowest pressure your system will see will be the PEEP, and that prevents airways from collapsing and reopening again and again. And that's important. So if you want to recruit more alveoli, or you want to have more alveolar units take part in inspiration and expiration, you keep the PEEP higher and you recruit more alveoli. So that helps you um, with uh, oxygenation. So you go up on FiO2 or you go up on uh, PEEP and you're uh, eventually going to improve their partial pressure of oxygen or the tension or the saturation of hemoglobin of oxygen. And the other thing you're doing is ventilation. So CO2 exchange, and this depends completely on your minute ventilation. So we talked about minute ventilation in the last, or minute volume in the last lecture, and that's your respiratory rate times your tidal volume. The more air you move in a minute, the more CO2 you're going to blow off. So if you, you'll, and you hear the word blowing off CO2 in the ICUs and on the floors uh, very frequently, what you're trying to do is take out more alveolar or more arterial um, carbon dioxide uh, and lower their PaCO2 which in turn should fix a respiratory acidosis. So those are, that's one the first key concept that I want you guys to remember uh, is FiO2 and PEEP uh, run your oxygenation show. 
um, your tidal volume or your respiratory rate, but more importantly, your minute ventilation runs your CO2 show. Um, so what modes do you need to know? Now, there are going to be parts in this lecture where you get confused, but don't worry, I'll get you back to where you need to be. So uh, before we talk about the modes, you need to understand the respiratory cycle. So uh, if you look at the scalars here, there are three. There's pressure, flow, and volume. Um, it starts off with an inspiratory limb, which is painted green here, goes to the expiratory limb, which is blue, and then there's a rest period between that. You not necessarily have to have a rest period unless you're breathing really fast. If you breathe really fast, you end inspiration, start expiration, end expiration, start inspiration, kind of goes there. And so we'll talk about that as well. So something has to trigger inspiration. So an event happens, a breath is triggered, you inspire, and then something has to end inspiration or a parameter on the ventilator that will tell the ventilator, I'm done inhaling, now I want to exhale. And that's called cycling. So something triggered this breath right at the beginning here, and then something cycled this breath, and we'll talk about each mode separately. Uh, and then there's also going to be a limit. So that is a number that will not get exceeded in any breath. So if you're in pressure control, your limit would be pressure. You're not going to exceed that pressure. If you're on volume control, you're not going to exceed that volume. So that'd be your limit. Now there's kind of confusing between cycling and limit. They're different things. Cycle is what's ending uh, a respiration, an inspiration um, or inspiratory breath. Uh, limit will get exceeded, will not get exceeded. So if you reach, you don't reach, sorry, you don't reach your cycle, but you reach your limit, it'll, trig it'll trigger back into uh, an expiration as well. I'll explain that in a lot more detail when we talk about specifically volume control, pressure control, pressure support, those kinds of things. Um, so two basic triggering modes you need to know about, assist control and pressure support. Um, and we'll talk about the very basic difference between these two. And then you go on to triggering modes. So this is usually uh, important for assist control, where if you're getting, if you're cycling modes, if you're on a pressure cycling, you're in a pressure control mode, or a time cycling, you're in a time uh, pressure control mode. If you're volume cycling, then you're in a volume control mode. The only one that's different is uh, pressure support, which cycles with flow. And so we'll, we'll talk about that in a little more detail, but triggering is something you need to understand before we go uh, through the modes. So there are two types of breaths. The triggered breath, which is when a patient generates inspiratory effort. So the ventilator senses that your flow is negative or your pressure is negative. Not necessarily both be negative, but one or the other. The ventilator can set that uh, or sense that and it'll give you a breath according to sensing that. We call that a triggered breath. That's different from a mandatory breath where there was no negative flow or negative pressure before that breath started. And what's that, what, what is that based on? Um, it's based on time. So if you set a respiratory rate, let's say 20 uh, a minute, your ventilator knows that every three seconds it has to give a breath. So from the start of inspiratory or inspiration, it'll start counting three seconds. If it didn't sense that you tried to get, take a breath, it'll give you a mandatory breath. Um, if you do generate flow or pressure that's negative and the ventilator senses that, then you get a triggered breath. Uh, for cycling, so um, for volume control, we talked about this. So when, you're, uh, when you reach that volume that you set, if you set a, a volume of 450 and it reached that 450, your breath's going to start cycling in expiration. Uh, in pressure control, it's done by time. So in addition to setting a pressure change, you also set the time you want that pressure change to happen for. Um, that time will cycle it uh, into expiration. And then flow is, uh, is or pressure support is, is cycled by flow. So when, it, when the ventilator starts sensing a decelerating flow, I think most of our ventilators are set to 25%, uh, it'll cycle back uh, into expiration. So uh, another key concept to understand before we talk about modes is uh, your equation of motion. Uh, and that's, it's basically been simplified in mechanical ventilation terms, but it means that pressure, flow, resistance, compliance are all related in one equation. Um, in this, there are three components that I put into red uh, into there are the three we actually set. So a pressure, um, the next one's flow, and the other one's tidal volume. So we set three of these. There are other settings we set it, uh, as well. The thing I want you guys to remember, not this equation, but remember that you can only be on one side or the other of this equation. So if you're in a volume control mode, your pressure is generated determining or determined by the compliance resistance, the tidal volume, all those things that you gave the patient. When you're in a pressure control mode, your flow and your tidal volume are determined by the resistance and the compliance of the patient. Okay? So you can never be in a pressure control mode also controlling volumes. There's one mode that does that. It's PRVC. I'm not going to talk about it because it's, it's complicated. And if you understand this, 
It's, you're, you're doing really good. So um, we talked about this. So pressure control, pressure support on this side of the equation. And then volume control is on the other side of the equation where you're controlling flow and controlling volume. Does this make sense? Not a single yes in the room. Can I hear something? Yes. Yes. Good. There you go. Um, OK. So uh, we talked about two modes, pressure support and assist control. Um, assist control is where each breath that is sensed by the machine, whether it's triggered or mandatory. So let's say one of you is on the ventilator and you try to suck in a breath. The machine senses that and it'll give you a breath according to what your set parameter was. So in this example I'm using, you set a patient on AC volume control of try to volume of 450. You tried to suck in air through the ET tube. Machine sensed that and machine gave you a breath of how much volume? 450. Now, you forgot to breathe the next breath. So you said, I'm just not going to breathe now. What's the machine going to do? It's going to give you another breath. That breath is also going to be assisted to 450. This is where it's different from SIMV. So SIMV is, what, is, what does SIMV stand for? Or Surgeon Initiated Mechanical Ventilation. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in SIMV, you set a mandatory rate. That mandatory rate, every breath given by that mandatory rate, is it's assisted completely to what you set it to. When you have uh, spontaneous breaths or triggered breaths, you can do whatever you want with that breath. So it's not completely assisted. Each breath is not completely assisted. Now these patients can either be awake or can be very heavily sedated. And I say that because you should not have a patient in pressure support completely sedated because it doesn't make sense. Also, this mode is where um, your patient's going to spend greater than 90% of the time on this mode. When you're in an ICU, you spend very little time on pressure support because that's an extubation mode. So remember that. Uh, so going to volume control, uh, this is probably 99% of patients will be on volume control in the MICU. Um, this is different from when you go to another unit. I don't know if there are any neurology people, but there are, people use different modes in different units. MICU, mostly um, the data says volume control, and it's kind of mixed data, so we're not going to go into that. Um, two variables that control CO2. Which one are those in there? Respiratory rate and? VT, tidal volume, very good. So those two control uh, CO2. Which ones control oxygen? Good. PEEP and FiO2. We're not going to worry about flow. Flow is a fellow thing. Don't worry about flow right now. It's very, very small instances where you can uh, change flow to affect things. Um, so respiratory rate is usually set. Um, it, it, it's very, that's a wide range. 12 to 28 is very wide. Why I, I put this out there is because I want you to know the upper limit. So 28 to 30, when you start going above that level, you stop having any time to exhale completely and you start taking another breath in very quickly. You would keep a lower rate for people in asthma exacerbations and COPD exacerbations. Anyone know why? Chronic retainers A and B? Breath stacking. So they auto peak. Okay? So any patient you have, even if you see a pH of 7.10 with a PCO2 in the hundreds, Reflexively, you want to put them at a rate of 28 and blow off CO2 as quick as you can. Remember, you're going to cause them more injury by doing that. So keep a low rate, usually around less than 20. Uh, if you try to go above 20, your attendings will probably be like, eh, let's take a break and see how it goes. Um, tidal volume, this is something that we mandate, and we'll talk about why you need this. Six to eight cc's per kg. And... Uh, the data started off from ARDSnet, ARDS trial, ARDS, uh, where they saw that when you go up on your tidal volumes above 6 cc's per kg, you start causing more lung injury uh, and your patients last on a vent longer. So as much as you can, 6 cc's per kg, if you can not do it at 6 where they're double triggering or there are other problems, you'll see some attendings or some fellows go up above 6 to 8 or close to 10, but it should never be in that range. Yes. That's ideal body weight. Correct, correct. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. This is very good. Um, ideal body weight, which is based off of height. So if you gain 200 pounds, your lungs don't get any bigger. But if you get two inches taller, your lungs get bigger. Um, PEEP is, so PEEP is what keeps your lungs open at the end of uh, expiration. So that's the lowest pressure your system is going to see ever during a respiratory cycle. Um, use higher PEEP to oxygenate people. So if you uh, have someone in bad ARDS, you'll see them be at much higher PEEP levels. 
Always remember that the sicker your patient is, or the higher your PEEP is, the sicker your patient is. So if you're thinking about extubating someone and they're on more than 10 a PEEP, it's probably not their day to get extubated today. Okay? Um, FiO2 is, is basically the same as any other system that you're using. More oxygen you give them, the more um, their SpO2 or PaO2 should go up. Uh, the lower number is interesting. So when, when I did residency, which is New Mexico, the lowest number would be 28 or 30. Uh, and here in our ICUs, almost every RT puts them on 40 at the lowest. So if you see 40, it probably means that that's where they're going to be before they get extubated. Uh, and we'll talk about extubation later. Flow is usually around 60 liters a minute. It varies between 40 to 80. Um, there's some instances where you can change flow to achieve uh, some, some things like better triggering or better um, uh, synchrony with the ventilator, uh, but we're not going to talk about that too much uh, today. So remember, we're on the right side of this equation. So we're in volume control. We're controlling flow. We're controlling tidal volume. And our pressures are de determined by the interaction between resistance compliance and the system. Okay? Questions about volume control? None. All right. AC pressure control. We'll come back to all these concepts. It'll make a lot more sense once we get towards the end of this lecture. Uh, pressure control is... Uh, so there are three variables now controlling your ventilation. Uh, you've got I time, you've got delta, uh, or your change in pressure, and then you've got your respiratory rate. So the respiratory rate is about the same. I forgot to mention when we were talking about volume. Look at what your patient's doing before you innovate them. So if someone's breathing at 30 a minute, and you paralyze them, and then you put them at 12, by the time you check a gas in an hour, they're going to be at pH of 6.9. So you've got to see what your patient's doing before... You, set your, you, you intubate them so that you know what to do with them after you've intubated them. Uh, this is different for someone who's, let's say, found down comatose. You intubate them. You had no idea what their respiratory rate was. So you put them on a rate, and you see how they do. Always get a blood gas after or an hour after you've intubated um, so you can know. Now, delta P is your basically what controls your tidal volume in this mode. So it's the amount of extra pressure to give a patient above PEEP. Okay, and that's important. I'll talk about why. Um, if you put someone on five over five, uh, there, and, and you want to increase their tidal volume, going up on that delta uh, of, of five will increase your tidal volume. So the more pressure you give them, the more volume you'll get, and that depends on the resistance and the compliance uh, of the patient. I time, we're not going to worry about too much, but usually around 0 0.9 is what we set. And you're, it's, it's not as important what your absolute eye time is, but what your ratio between the time you get for inspiration and the time you get for expiration. Um, it's a little complicated, so I'm going to skip that part too. Uh, but if you know how to change pressure in this mode, that's one of the most important things. Uh, PEEP and FiO2 usually don't change in this mode. Uh, the reason I mentioned um, PEEP and delta P is because when you are in a volume control mode, your pressures depend on the lungs and the circuit. When you're in a pressure control mode, you dictate what your peak pressure is going to be. Your peak pressure is going to be your PEEP plus the delta. So that will always, always be the case unless you have auto PEEP or something else, and we'll talk about that. Um, so volumes are determined by the interplay with resistance and compliance, uh, and then you increasing your delta will increase your tidal volume. So when you put someone on a vent with pressure control, if you do, uh, you put them at a certain number, let's say 10 uh, a pressure, uh, pressure uh, delta P and five a PEEP. And then you look at your tidal volume. If your tidal volume is 200 cc's on 10 of delta, you want to go up on your delta to get up to your six cc's per kg sort of thing. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes? Good. Okay. Um, this is a good graph to see. So when you've um, taken your delta P up higher, um, your volume has increased. And this is what I wanted you to show you here. This is your eye time. So you start ins inspiring, and then as soon as you hit that time where the machine knows you want to cycle into expiration, you'll start breathing out. Okay? All right, pressure support. No mandatory breaths. So if you try to take a breath, it will give you a breath and support it to the pressure you set it at. Um, if you don't take a breath, you forget to breathe, you stay apneic. Okay? There is a backup rate in the ventilator, so there's apnea alarms that if you don't breathe for, I think it's somewhere between 10 and 20 seconds, 
The machine will switch back to the last mode you were at and start, and it'll keep bleeping until someone looks at it and says that someone was on a pressure support trial and went apneic. This is something we use to wean the ventilator. So in the morning, and we'll talk about extubation towards the end, in the morning, people will be on breathing trials with pressure support. They call it CPAP. This is not CPAP. CPAP is what you use at home. Uh, this is pressure support. So uh, people are usually awake and following commands on this mode. It changes just very slightly when you're on a trach. Because on trach patients, you want to keep pressure supporting them so that you can get them off the ventilator eventually. Uh, so three settings only, simplest mode to set. Three settings, pressure support, PEEP, and FiO2. And out of that, PEEP and FiO2 don't even change. But the thing that does change is the numbers that you use on them. So you'll see that previously, PEEP, I said 5 to 20. Uh, I said FiO2 would be 30 to 100. You do not want someone on a pressure support trial to be on a lot of vent support. So their PEEP should be low. All the data suggests less than 8. Uh, so 5 to 8, usually put them on 7 over 5 is probably the most common you'll see uh, in the ICUs. Uh, and FiO2 should be low, so less than 60% before you extubate someone. Um, pressure support, again, is a similar thing as pressure control where you put them on a pressure and then you see what they do. If your volumes look good, their minute ventilation looks good on the current pressure support you put them on, you continue. If it's low, you up your pressure support, similar to what you were doing uh, in pressure control until you get your set tidal volume. Um, again, in this mode as well, your peak pressure is still going to be a sum of your pressure support plus your peep. So whatever pressure you start off at, the lowest pressure, plus the pressure support uh, that you're getting on top of it. Uh, and then again, we're on the left side of the equation, so everything your flow and your, and your tidal volumes are all determined by the compliance uh, and the resistance. Now, one difference that I didn't explain to you in, in, uh, in volume control and pressure control uh, is that when you have um, a, uh, a patient on volume control and their compliance goes bad, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain compliance to you later on, so I'll just give you an example, that they go into flash pulmonary edema. Your volumes are going to stay the same because you've set a volume. Your pressures will go higher, okay? When you're on a pressure control mode, because you're mandating what pressure needs to be there, what drops? Your tidal volume. So your tidal volume goes down significantly because your compliance has gone down. And that will alarm. Both of them will alarm. One will alarm with peak pressures. The other will alarm with low tidal volumes. So just remember that when you're on a different mode, if you're on a volume mode, you get the volume until a peak pressure is reached, an alarm for a peak pressure is reached. When you're on pressure control, you'll drop your tidal volumes when your compliance goes bad. Okay? And that happens, it's the same for pneumothoraces, right, main stem intubations, uh, things like those. So just another example of when you increase, so when you're increasing pressure support, that increase in pressure support increase your, t your tidal volume that your patient got. So if you get put someone on 7 over 5, 7 of pressure support, 5 of PEEP, you didn't get a good tidal volume, what do you do? Go up on your pressure support and go up by 2 or 3 points and see where you get. Um, this is the one slide that I mentioned on BiPAP, but it's very similar to pressure support. The, the terminology is different, but the mode is exactly the same. So you have three settings, inspiratory pressures, expiratory pressures, and FiO2. Your EPAP is exactly the same as your PEEP. That's the lowest pressure in your system. Your IPAP is your PEEP plus your delta that you were doing. So it's just a very, very slight difference, and I'll ex explain that to you in a little better detail. Usually for a slim, slender patient, someone like Dino, we'd start off at 12 over 6. Uh, I'll skip that one. <laughs> um, but so someone who's a little heavier set, we would go up higher. Usually increasing that gap between IPAP and EPAP um, will... I was not pointing at you, Jared. <laughs> But you're putting yourself on the spot. Uh, increasing the gap between IPAP and EPAP is what will get, get you better tidal volumes. So uh, that's also uh, a, a similar thing. So this, this um, uh, diagram, so this EPAP here is denoting the same thing as PEEP on pressure support. The IPAP is the absolute pressure. So if I were to put someone on 5 over 5, if I put them on 5 of PEEP and 5 of pressure support, and I wanted to repli replicate 5 over 5 on a BiPAP, what would the settings be? EPAP would stay the same as PEEP, so that would be 5. IPAP would become a sum of PEEP plus your pressure support, and that would be 10. So 10 over 5 on BiPAP is exactly the same thing as 5 over 5 on pressure support. Does that make sense? The only difference in BiPAP and pressure support is one is with a mask without an ET tube or a trach. The other one's done with a trach or an ET tube. 
Okay? Um, all right. Uh, what time do I have to, do you know? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Okay. We might need a, a second session, but that's okay. So, um, talking about harming a patient on a ventilator. There are many kinds of ways we can harm a patient. In fact, a ventilator is a perfect lung injury model. Okay? If you don't use it correctly, you'll kill your patient. So, there's a lot of things that you have to watch for and be, be cognizant of so that you can do good, a good job with mechanical ventilation. So some of the things that are not directly related to the, the mechanics and the interplay between the ventilator and the, the patient are things like things that happen with intubations, traumatic intubations. That can cause injury to a patient. Uh, sedation, very well known to cause delirium. You put a patient on benzos for five days, he won't wake up for another three days. Uh, and then when he wakes up, he's very, very disoriented. Um, and then things like post-ICU depression, PTSD, these things are real. Uh, these things happen every day in the ICU. We don't see the after effects of them. But be cognizant of them. So well, I'm telling you this because before you put a patient on and before you take them off, you got to be cognizant of these things, okay? Um, and then there are the things that we do actually with our ventilator settings. So there are four mechanisms of injury uh, that are very well known that cause injury from a ventilator. Bear trauma, which is related to pressure. Volume trauma from, from actual over distension of the lungs. Uh, Adelaide trauma, which is from repeated opening and closing or collapsing or recruitment, de-recruitment of the lung. And then hyperoxia. Um, this is way better studied in the peds population. Uh, we all know their retinopathy prematurity and all those things that we've seen uh, in medical school, I guess. Um, so barotrauma. Two pressures you need to be uh, aware of. Peak pressures and plateau pressures. Just remember them for what their, word, what their names are right now. I'll explain to you what exactly they are afterwards. Um, both of these pressures need to be mandated at below a certain number so that we can know what they are. So what is your peak pressure? Your peak pressure is the highest pressure your system sees. You take a breath in, you look at the curve, that highest pressure that the, 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 the system saw is your peak pressure. To get your plateau pressure, you need to do a maneuver. What is the maneuver called? Inspiratory hold, very good. So you do an inspiratory hold, and what you really did in this patient is that you eliminated flow, okay? Now you look at this equation here, if you get rid of flow, which is this V dot, you got rid of the entire component of resistance. So it's zero multiplied by resistance. All you are left with in the system is compliance or elastic issues. Um, this number will tell you a lot of information because at this point in time, when you've given a patient a breath and held the breath, your ventilator has a direct connection of air from the alveolus to the ET tube. Your ventilator can measure the pressure at the alveolus, and this is actually called the alveolar pressure, the, the plateau pressure. So those are numbers that we go by, 12, 40 for peak pressures, 25 for plateau pressures. You'll see a, a variation of maybe five in those, uh, where someone will say that we're okay with 30 plateau pressures. Usually I use 25 or 28 at the top um, to prevent barotrauma. Uh, things that you'll see in a patient with barotrauma, pneumothoraces. Uh, you leave at night, come in in the morning, and your patient's Michelin man. Do you know what that is? Subcutaneous emphysema. I'm sure a couple of you have seen cases of that. Th these are all of, uh, related to barotrauma. So if you get a patient who's had these things, you should suspect that somewhere in the initial part of this stay, we did some injury to the patient with, uh, with, bar with pressure. Um, volume trauma. So you're over distending the lung. This is the worst out of all of the injuries we cause. Um, and there's very good data for this. Um, we, about 20 years ago, our, your set tidal volume on a patient would be anywhere between 800 to 1400 mLs per breath. Uh, you look in the ICU right now, you won't see a single patient above 600 mLs. And that's a huge change that's happened in uh, the world of mechanical ventilation. Now, someone mentioned ideal body weight. You did. Uh, so ideal body weight calculations. The simple way of doing it, it's 50 for each, uh, for up to 5 feet. So if anyone's 5 feet, 50 kgs is their ideal body weight. Every kg they go above it, 2.3 kgs, or every inch they go above it, you add 2.3 kgs to their, to their ideal body weight. It's 4.5 kilos lower for women. Um, I've, I usually teach my residents uh, this uh, kind of range. So for the average American female, 5'4", tidal volumes are between 330 to 440. Average American male, 5'10", tidal volumes between 440 and 580. So um, the reason this is important is because it causes an inflammatory cascade. You get cytokines, you get fever, you get really, really sick from volume trauma. We don't see it as much because the patient's already sick as not to start off with. 
You put them on a ventilator, cause injury, it's not going to add too much to their picture. You take someone healthy and do that to them, you'll see them get a lot sicker really quickly. So pay attention to that. This is a study from crit uh, Critical Care Medicine 2014 uh, telling you that Adelaide trauma is actually not that bad. What's actually worse is volume trauma for patients. So this chart at 3 a.m. or 3.30 in the morning, you want to choose a tidal volume. For a female, stay between 350 and 450, you'll probably be good. Uh, if for a male, stay between 450 and 550, you'll probably be good. Knowing that this is for the average American male and average American female. At 7 o'clock in the morning before you round, take out a calculator and calculate it out. At least you prevented injury in the morning and you look good for your attending when you present. All right. Um, Adelaide -like trauma. So this is from repeated uh, uh, recruitment and de-recruitment of the lung. Um, when you add PEEP to a patient, this is exactly what you're preventing. So that low PEEP of five is, is trying to keep all the alveoli open. And we only need PEEP when we're on positive pressure. All of us right now are doing negative pressure ventilation. We don't need PEEP because we don't have that sucking out of air with a ventilator and, and getting um, uh, filled up with air uh, with pressure. So there's a very good video that I actually took off of YouTube. Um, hopefully this works. So that's a lung without any PEEP applied to it, okay? And you'll see that this guy's trying to bag pretty, pretty hard, and you see the lung looks all mottled and all nodular. So see what happens when you put PEEP onto this patient. So you see how those alveoli are getting recruited? And when he lets go of the, of the, of the bag, it stays recruited. It doesn't collapse back into, again, like the shriveled lung on the other end. So this is exactly what PEEP's doing for you. It does a lot for your patient. Um, and it's also preventing injury. So um, keep, keep PEEP in mind, at least five of PEEP. Uh, go higher when you need to oxygenate. And the last one's hyperoxia. There isn't a lot of good data for this. Uh, and in fact, this is the largest meta-analysis I could find. I think it was 18 studies that they included in this. Um, they excluded all sepsis patients, all pneumonia patients. So it, it, it's not even talking about my population that I see. But there are strokes, there are ACS patients in here. And they did a meta-analysis saying that there are better outcomes, lower mortality, when you get exposed to less oxygen. And by hyperoxia, they, uh, they define it by a PaO2 greater than 300 uh, millimeters of mercury. Uh, so for not very good evidence for it, but try to keep your patient on the lowest amount of FiO2 that keeps your SATs barely above the 92 mark and that 65 mark on PaO2. Even if you look at the effect, it's not a, a very strong effect uh, that's favoring normoxia uh, on this study, but I'm sure there'll be more literature coming out. Um, I think I can do this. Okay, so three most common alarms. Uh, peak pressures, uh, low tidal volumes, and uh, a low sat on the ventilator. That last one is where I want most of your attention, um, but I'll talk about the other two as well. Uh, so looking at the equation of motion again, uh, now, there, now we're gonna talk about those two things that we didn't talk about, your compliance and your resistance. So um, resistance is, is basically um, your airway, so from your ventilator till the tip of the ET tube is usually where resistance issues come. Um, compliance has gotta do with the actual lung being sick, okay? So talking about compliance, um, the, how you define it is a change in volume over change in pressure. How I want you to think about it is if someone's compliance goes bad, it takes more pressure to get the same amount of volume, okay? Um, so decreased compliance, harder to inflate the lungs, you get higher peak pressures and higher plateau pressures, okay? So if you remember this part of plateau, that you're compliant with worsening compliance, your plateau goes up. That's all you need to know about peak and plateau pressures. Now, when you have someone whose compliance goes up or their resistance goes up, that peak pressure will climb. The only way you can tell whether this is a compliance issue or a resistive issue is inspiratory hold. Beautiful. So let's do an inspiratory hold on this patient. And we did an inspiratory hold and you see that the plateau is very close to the peak pressure. What does that tell you? Is this a resistance issue or a compliance issue? Compliance. compliance. Very good. It's written right up top over there. All right. So now when you go to a, another instance where you've got a resistance issue, you do the same inspiratory hold, and you see that your plateau pressure fell a lot lower. So the amount of comp or, or elastic pressure or resistance, elastic pressure that you have is a lot lower than the resistance issue. So his, this gentleman peak pressuring is rightly related to a resistance problem. So uh, just comparing inspiratory holds, what are we doing? We're focusing on compliance. We're getting rid of the flow. Getting rid of flow gets rid of resistance. All you're left with in the system is pressure from compliance. 
So looking at these two inspiratory holds together, uh, that's the one that we talked about where your resistance was increased and the other ones where your compliance was increased. And I've, I've kind of made this chart in which you can see the total amount of pressure. So PEEP is where you started off with, that's the lowest pressure your system saw. You added on compliance pressure to it and then you added on resistive pressure to it. When your plateau fell to almost normal, most of your problem was with resistance. When, you, when your pressure didn't fall too much, you still have so much compliance pressure that your resistive, when you excluded it, your plateau is still pretty high up. Does this make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay, good. Um, where was I going with this? Oh yeah, okay, good. So, um, figuring out a peak pressure, middle of the night, someone's peak pressuring, you gotta figure out if it's a just plateau being high or is it both, my plateau is normal and my peak is high because that'll tell you how to fix the patient. Uh, save me a phone call at night. So, um, resistance issues, as I said, from the vent till the tip of the ET tube. Bronchospasm, kinked ET tubes, kinked circuit. One, I remember once, this is the funniest thing I've had in my intern year. I was stepping on an ET tube cable, the blue tubing, the corrugated tubing, and I, I stayed on it, and I kept looking at the vent, and I'm like, the vent's at 50, I don't know what's going on. And I literally stepped away from the patient, everything got fixed. So, uh, remember, all the resistance issues happen from the machine till the tip of the ET tube. Uh, we talked about bronchospasm, patients biting on the tube. Most patients have a bite block in, uh, in the ICU, so you won't see that as much. But if it slips, uh, you'll see that. And then mucus plugs. So that happens in the middle of the night, always. Best time for a mucus plug to happen. Three o'clock in the morning, uh, you're almost about to go to bed and enjoy an hour's sleep, and boom. Um, do this maneuver, uh, the inspiratory hold, and figure out, is it from the tube itself, or is it from the lungs itself? And then talking about compliance issues, these are actual lung problems. Um, a pneumothorax, pulmonary edema, uh, bad, bad pneumonias. If you have something external in the pleural space, a pneumothorax and large pleural effusion, or even a right main stem intubation, you'll see your plateau and your peak pressure be very close to each other. Okay? Uh, and then this is the last part of, of the high pressures. So um, auto peep, I'm sure everyone's at least heard a tale of auto peep, at least. Um, it's, it's, it's the other word uh, we use for it is breath stacking. I think Sam used breath stacking about it. Um, it's, it's when your patient's not getting enough time to completely exhale. So if you, I want all of you guys to do this right now. Take a breath in, exhale half of it out, and then take another breath on top of it and do it again. What will eventually happen is your chest will be this big and you're not going to be able to move any volume. So your pressures will rise and your volumes will fall. Uh, the, the, one of the best ways to figure out that someone's going into auto peep is you look at your flow curve. Now most times your flow curve will come back all the way to normal, so baseline before it takes off for another breath. In auto peep, you'll see that it takes off from a lot lower in the flow curve. So your flow has not gone down to zero before it starts going into positive flow again. Eventually this patient will become hypotensive and almost code because there's so much pressure in the chest that you can't, your heart's completely compressed by it. That's a situation where you disconnect the ET tube, don't take it out, just disconnect it from the vent, and then connect it back up in, in a couple of seconds. And what that does is allows it to, it to deflate. It'll only give you a bang for your buck for two minutes. It's gonna happen right again if you don't do the things to fix it. Um, and then to look for uh, an uh, auto peep, you do what we call an expiratory hold. So you have the patient breathe in, breathe out all the way, and then you hold their breath. And the scalar looks something like this. It'll rise a little bit. So your peep that you were actually giving a patient was here, and then your auto peep is this top part. So that's, if you had a, t a set peep of five, your total peep over there is 10. So your intrinsic peep is five. Does that make sense to everyone? So up to, f up to two to four people are okay with auto peep. Uh, when it starts going above that four mark, we start getting worried and start to do something about it. Um, the other two alarms was, so one was tidal volumes and the other is low oxygen. I'll probably stop right there um, after uh, the end of the alarms. Um, so when your tidal volumes go out, one of the first things you want to make sure is your vent didn't get disconnected. Because that's very commonly happens in the ICU. It slips a little bit, you start getting leak or there's a port that's opened up. Uh, the best people to call when event alarms is RT. They have dealt with ventilators for way longer in their lives than you have ever. Uh, I, I, when I can't figure out a vent, I call the RT because that's their, that's their job. Um, so look for a circuit being disconnected. The other one's cuff leak. And I'll talk about cuff leak the next time a little more in detail as well because that's something you look for uh, before you extubate and also look for or you, you freak out about when it happens in the middle of the night because someone needs a tube change then. 
Okay? And then bronchopleural fistula is interesting because when you get a hole in the lung, it's communicating with the pleural space. You put in volume to the, to the lung, it goes out that hole into the pleural space. If you have a chest tube, it goes into the chest tube. And you only get back 100 cc's of the 400 you gave the patient. That's another common reason why uh, you would get low tidal volumes. Um, and then this is something I picked up from Life in the Fast Lane. Any people subscribe to it? Yeah, it's a pretty good, pretty good blog. Uh, so there, uh, this gentleman, Chris Nixon, came up with a DOPES for uh, a patient being hypoxic on a ventilator. Uh, so your tube moving, so right main stem or extubation, um, a mucus plug or something else, blood clot that comes a tip of ET tube blocks it off. Um, pneumothorax, pulmonary edema, bad pneumonias, aspiration, uh, things that can happen to the patient. Your equipment mal malfunctioning. Very rarely does this happen because every vent before it gets out of the RT office into a ICU room is, has been checked. And you see that the, the drape they put on top of it and there's stickers on it that say that they've checked everything. So it rarely happens, but it can. And the last one, stacked breaths. So if you're auto-peeping, uh, you'll drop your SATs. You'll also get hypotensive, bradycardic, and potentially code. So um, those. it's a quick way for, when I was a resident, I would use this to quickly triage someone who's hypoxic on a ventilator and figure out why uh, that is the case. So uh, just going back to like clarifying the auto-peak thing, mm -hmm. so when you do the expiratory pause, mm -hmm. so you have known what their peak was and then you look at their peak again, is that what you're saying? Correct. So... So you know your so you know your peep because you've set your peep, right? So you set a peep of five on a patient. When you do an expiratory hold, there will be a thing that shows you total peep. So your total peep, if it's ten and your set peep was five, you know that your intrinsic peep is a difference between those two numbers. Okay. Yes, Jared. Um, just sort of not you back in, but with our systems, with the expiratory pause, does the machine automatically take the number when it um, gets the uh, correct time, or do you have to time it yourself? No. So it, it'll it'll time itself. So you just keep holding it. And it'll keep it held. Now, remember, it's not going to always be possible to do an inspiratory hold. If someone's breathing 40 times a minute on a vent, and you try to stop them from breathing, they're not going to let you stop. They're stronger than you are. Uh, so they're going to keep breathing, and you won't see an inspiratory hold or an expiratory hold happen. So only when someone's breathing fast. Another thing I didn't tell you guys was, don't, so if you're, if you're, so your plateau pressure is always going to be lower than your peak pressure, obviously, right? Uh, if your plateau, if your peak pressure is normal, you don't need to check a plateau pressure every time. It's only when you're peak pressuring that you want to check out what your uh, plateau is. Other questions? Well, thank you very much, guys. I'll be back again.